I invite you to turn with me in the Word of God, of God tonight to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, our, our text tonight will be verses 16 through 18, but I might just set the context for a moment. At verse 12 in our chapter, it's very clear that Paul pivots towards parting exhortations. There have been exhortations uh, to the people of God to honor the ministry and the rule which has been placed into their midst in order to strengthen them. And then there has been an exhortation to the people of God as a whole in verses 14 through 15 about how they treat one another, that they are to sustain and strengthen uh, those who are weak and be patient towards all. And then finally, we get some very direct and personal admonitions here, beginning at verse 16, and that's where our text begins tonight. And so we read God's holy, inspired, infallible, and inerrant word. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The great 19th century Scottish Presbyterian theologian and commentator James Denny posts the following heading over this short section of exhortations as he writes, the standing orders of the gospel, the standing orders of the gospel. And he goes on to say the three precepts of these verses may be called the standing orders of the Christian church. However various the circumstances in which Christians may find themselves, the duties prescribed are always binding upon them. Of course, the language of standing orders comes from the martial world, the world of the military, where it refers to a set of orders or duties which are binding upon the soldier, irrespective of situation or condition. That's how I would like us to hear these words tonight from verses 16 through 18 because what uh, the Apostle is saying to all of us tonight is no matter what situation we are in, we can be assured of this fact that there are some non-negotiable duties. There are some non-negotiable duties which are binding upon us and that is to pray that is to rejoice, and that is to give thanks, and to underline and underscore their binding authority for all of us, for all generations, and in all situations. Paul caps off his exhortation at the end of verse 18, saying, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. This is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. So to follow these standing orders is God's will for you. And so if you want to know what the will of God is, Paul makes it very plain tonight. He's given us marching orders to rejoice, to pray, and to give thanks. And so I'd like to think of each one of these exhortations one by one with you tonight for a moment and the first thing that comes to mind as I look at verse 16 is the adverb always, always, because it means just like it sounds to us in the Greek as it would in English, it is all inclusive, all times, all places, all circumstances, forever, always. And then the command here is rejoice, which means to be in a state of gladness, a rejoicing, it is in the imperative mood, which means it is a command that is in the present tense, which means it is perpetual and ongoing. So the thing that the apostle calls the believer to do, the standing order that we are given tonight, is to always be rejoicing. And because it is commanded, we can discern and deduce from that fact that rejoicing is something that is an act of the will. Rejoicing is something that is an act of the will. It is not an emotion. It is not primarily a feeling. It is a determination that God calls us 
to act upon. And the thing that is so important for us to grasp about this call to rejoice is that it's not grounded merely in the rejoicing in natural circumstances. And what I mean by natural circumstances would be joyful in our youthfulness, for example, or joyful in our health, or joyful in our possessions, or joyful in our material prosperity, or joyful because life is going well. Those are what we would call natural circumstances, and I don't believe that we can limit the rejoicing to that, or even primarily to that, And one of the reasons is because of the context of the letter of 1 Thessalonians. Because as you read this letter in light of its context, particularly the book of Acts, one of the things that you will discern about the Thessalonian church and the congregation is that it is a people who have known nothing but constant affliction and suffering on account of Christ and the gospel. It is a congregation that has been torn apart by false teachers It is a congregation full of people who've lost everything for the sake of following Christ and leaving paganism. It is a group of people who've lost fellow family members and believers. It is a congregation that has borne heavy burdens. And to those people, Paul says, rejoice always. So by reflecting even just momentarily upon the broad context of the letter of Thessalonians, it should be clear to us that rejoicing in natural things doesn't quite match the situation. Even though it's right and it's proper that we rejoice in the good and the natural things that God gives us, clearly there is something more for us to think about. And so as we contemplate that idea, I thought I'd just give us a few texts as examples of the kind of rejoicing that the Apostle Paul has in mind. And so I'll give one that may not naturally come to mind, but it's Romans 16, 19, where the Apostle Paul speaks of rejoicing in the obedience of fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as he says, for the report of your obedience has reached us all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. So clearly what has come first in the sequence here is that the Apostle Paul has heard the good news and the testimony about the Christians in Rome and the thing that he isolates and thinks about and mentions as a basis for his rejoicing is the fruit of righteousness that is so manifest in their life. And as he contemplates the report of of that obedience and that fruit of righteousness, flowing as it does out of a heart of renewal, a regenerated heart and life, the Apostle Paul gives thanks and he rejoices. So one reason for rejoicing, we can say from the Word of God, is that when we see God's grace at work in the lives of others, it ought to provoke us and prompt us to rejoice. So clearly here, this kind of rejoicing is a rejoicing that is indicted by the notice of spiritual things going on. Another text that I might think upon for our reflection tonight about this call to rejoice is located in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Here's another example of the duty and the call to rejoice here. And this time, it flows from the context of the greatest possible personal difficulty. As Paul seeks, uh, or rather Jesus speaks of the people of God being insulted and persecuted. And people saying false, mean, ugly things about them. All of these are very strong terms. Insult means to revile. Persecute means to systematically oppress and harass. And false accusations is about being charged with evil and corrupt and wicked things. Yet in spite of all of that, Jesus says, when that happens, you are to do what? You are to rejoice. And the reason given, Jesus says, because of me. Me. 
In other words, what Jesus says, another occasion for the rejoicing of the people of God is persecution for the sake of Christ. Persecution for the sake of standing with Jesus Christ. Persecution for being willing to openly and publicly be named with Christ. And so whether that's at work or whether that's with your family or among the circle of people you associate with or more broadly beyond that, simply by identifying with Him and acknowledging that He is your Lord and Savior, Jesus says, there will be times and situations where you receive insult, where you are spoken evilly of, when you are persecuted. And Jesus says, in that situation... Rejoice. A spiritual thing. One more uh, verse by way of example here would be James chapter 1 verse 2 where he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Notice this is again a call to rejoice. And note the verb here, consider. It's a, it's a mental act. It's not an emotion. It is a determination it is something that flows from the life of the mind. And the thing that we are to rejoice in, James says, is our trouble. When trials and difficulties and afflictions come upon us, James says the duty of the people of God is to do precisely the opposite of what they feel. They are to consider it joy. They are to rejoice. And so the call to rejoice then, I've just gone over a few verses, presents us with a duty in a vast array of situations and challenging circumstances. And so I would argue tonight the rejoicing, again, is just not in that which is natural. It's primarily and particularly in things spiritual. But as we think about the implication of this command, I would draw our attention to two ideas tonight. And the one is that this is a distinctly Christian characteristic. It is a distinctly Christian characteristic. And one reason why I say that is because the flesh leads us to behave the opposite of joy and rejoicing, particularly under affliction and trial and difficulty and slander. You see, the flesh would lead us to dreariness and dullness and to melancholy. And if you think about it, who in their right mind wouldn't think that way? Right? Who wants to rejoice in the obedience of others? Who wants to rejoice in being insulted for Christ's sake? Who desires to rejoice in trial? You see, the duty of rejoicing calls us to something different than that which is natural. The duty before us is distinctly Christian. And that leads us to our second point about this rejoicing, is that it is a distinct work and fruit of the Spirit of God. This kind of rejoicing that Paul speaks of is the fruit and the result of of the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit of God whom He's given us. This kind of rejoicing in things not just natural, but things of the worst sort of trial and persecution and insult and slander, and even the work of God in other people's lives, is the kind of thing that is done when the Spirit of God dwells within the believer and begins working in them and producing His distinct, pure, holy fruit in. And so tonight, as we hear this command, we begin by acknowledging it's not a work that's within our reach or our grasp if we're simply up to our strength. It's something that will have to flow from a work of God's grace within us. And so the first exhortation or the first standing order of the gospel uh, for renewed and redeemed and regenerated people is to rejoice always. And then that leads us to a second standing order of the gospel, 
Pray without ceasing. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. And the word for prayer here is generic in terms of of the meaning of the word. Basically, it's the sense of, of our requests. And so it could be prayers and supplications and thanksgiving. It could cover a whole gambit of situations and contexts, but, but broadly, it's all kinds of requests, and notice that which qualifies it is unceasingly. And that's precisely what makes this such an intriguing and difficult command. Because not only have we been commanded to rejoice always, now we're being commanded to pray without ceasing or unceasingly. I remember years ago hearing a very famous radio preacher whose name, if I mentioned it, you would immediately recognize. And I remember hearing him. And by the way, it was a, he preached a marvelous series of sermons on the book of 1 Thessalonians. But when he got to this request, one of the things that he, that he proclaimed is that what Paul is calling for and what is appropriate to the admonition is that we would pray just about, as he said, every other breath. Now, at the time, I, I felt something instinctually wrong about that. But again, you know, we shouldn't measure the righteousness of the law of God based upon our ability to perform it. So if he was right, that, that I guess would be fine for us. But then you go on to think about this command in its context, and what you realize is that God would be telling us to do something that's impossible because we have three standing orders that we're to engage in with the greatest of regularity, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to everything give thanks. So so the question would be, well, which one are we supposed to do? So I think I can agree with the suggestion of a leading grammarian who says the sense here is to pray at intervals or to pray as an unceasing habit or a regular activity. In other words, what Paul is admonishing us to do is to have a prayer life. I don't believe the Apostle Paul is telling us that every single time we turn around, we need to get on our knees and pray. But what he is doing is admonishing us to be people of prayer, to be a praying people. And so I want to reinforce that sense of the admonition with just a few texts here that you're already well aware of. And one of them would be Romans 12, 12, where the Apostle Paul exhorts the Roman church to be devoted to prayer. He says to them, be devoted to prayer. And that devotion is is to persist in something obstinately. And so the calling of every believer, according to the Apostle Paul, is to commit themselves to prayer with a dogged determination and consistency. Another passage which we might think of is Ephesians 6, 8, when the Apostle says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times. Again, the, the, the command feels so universal and so sweeping that it, that it seems that the apostle is saying that every breath we ought to be praying. But I think one of the things that we want to consider here when we hear that command in Ephesians 6 to 18 is the context where the apostle Paul has just expounded upon what it means to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might as we fight against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness in this age. And he said it's through the putting on of that spiritual armor. And at the end of that exposition of the spiritual armor, the apostle pivots towards this admonition. Let your requests and prayers be known at all times, praying at all times. What is he underscoring and highlighting? But the inseparable connection between the the putting on of the spiritual armor and being strong in the Lord and the power of his might through the means of prayer. And so what he is saying then is that unceasing prayer, regular prayer, prayer at intervals is essential for our spiritual protection. How about Colossians 4.2? Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it 
same word that we had over here in Romans 12, 12. Be devoted. Here he says, devote yourself to prayer. It is a command to persistently pray. But I want you to notice how it's qualified here. He says, uh, the kind of prayer the apostle Paul is speaking of is qualified when he says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert, keeping alert. And so that refers to a mental watchfulness and an alertness. In other words, we could say that it's about praying with information, praying with information, praying by observing and taking note and acquiring knowledge according to the needs and the circumstances of the people of God. So this is about... Uh, informed prayer. But yet again, it is a devoted kind of praying. And so the Apostle Paul, from various angles in his uh, numerous letters, reinforces this as a, as a part of the Christian life. Again, the standing order of the gospel. It's a standing order of those who have been marked out as Christ's who are indwelt by the Spirit, who are washed in the blood, those kinds of people, the Word of God teaches us, are people who are devoted to prayer. And so my simple point of application tonight on this exhortation is that prayer is a mark of the believer. Persistent, regular, devoted prayer is a mark of the believer. There's this tucked away little statement uh, that um, is very fascinating. And it's located in Acts 9-11. And it's simply this. Behold, he prayed. You might remember who that was said to. It was said to, to Ananias that, that wonderful man of God whom the Lord used to baptize the Apostle Paul. And as Ananias hears and receives this uh, command from God, he, he protests. If you'll remember, he protests and he pushes back and he says, Lord, I've heard uh, from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to, to bind all who call on your name. You see, that's a sensible response. Lord, Lord, I've heard about this vicious man who breathes out murderous threats and, and he arrests and, and um, he brings in the people of God to jail and he binds them, he takes them to Jerusalem for nothing less than confessing Jesus Christ. He was terrified of Paul. Rightly so. And yet one of the means that the Lord uses to persuade Ananias to do God's will is that he told him he prays. He has a markedly changed life. He has been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has been made new. Behold, he prays. There's a wonderful statement in the Heidelberg Catechism on prayer when it asks, why is it necessary to pray? To pray? And the answer, a prayer is the chief part of thankfulness which we owe to God. Prayer is the chief part of thankfulness which we owe to God. The believer prays because the believer has tasted of the grace of Jesus Christ and therefore we long to linger about the throne of grace. James Denny, that Scottish theologian and commentator who I quoted at the outset, whom is the one who gave us this phrase, the standing orders of the gospel, says that prayer is that exercise in which we hold up our hearts to him that we may be filled with his fullness and changed into his likeness. Prayer is a means of grace as our catechism teaches us in the Westminster Standards. And therefore, it is a mark of the believer. We pray. The standing order of the gospel is to not only rejoice always, but to pray without ceasing. And then finally, we see the third order in verse 18. In everything, 
give thanks. The word thanks doesn't need to be explained. It's already self-evident. I think in everything is already self-evident as well. Give thanks in everything. It's broad. It seems to be all-encompassing. With the exclusion that Matthew Poole points out, we don't give thanks to God for falling into sin. But we do pray and give thanks to God for everything else. We give thanks for everything lawful and everything moral and for all the mercies obtained by prayer. We give thanks to God for His providences. We give thanks to God for His gifts. We give thanks to God in adversity. We even give thanks to God in trial because we know that He's working out in us an eternal weight of glory. And so we give thanks. But notice here the reason. Paul not only gives us the duty, but he goes on to ground it as he says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You see, that four signals that he's giving explanation and whether the explanation which follows is for all three of the exhortations to rejoice evermore, to pray without ceasing and everything give thanks, we can be sure of this. It certainly applies to giving thanks. But notice here what the Apostle Paul tells us. He provides us the reason for why we are to be these thanksgiving kinds of Christians. He says flatly and assertively, because it is the will of God. Why are to we be thanksgiving Christians? And the answer is plain and simple. Because it is the will of God. It's a duty. Not just for believers, it's a duty for everyone. Remember in Romans 1.21, the apostle highlights something about the unbeliever that is chief among the problems that God has with unbelief. It says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Think of all the the things that you could say about the unbelieving world. And the, the leading thought that the Apostle Paul says about the unbelieving world is they don't honor God and they do not give thanks. But what an unmistakable way to reinforce to the believer that our calling is to give thanks to God in everything. If pagans and unbelievers ought to and they don't, surely the believer should because Paul continues this reason for giving thanks as he not only says, it is the will of God, but then he goes on to say, it is the will of God for you in Christ. Notice the gospel basis because of Christ. Whether it means because we are in Christ or whether it's on account of Christ, which means that of his mercies which have come to us, Clearly, the Apostle Paul is grounding the call to duty, the obedience to the standing order, and the experience of gospel grace. What that tells us tonight, people of God, is that giving thanks cannot be accomplished by a sheer act of will. It cannot be accomplished by a sheer act of will or determination It flows from our union with Jesus Christ. It flows from our being engrafted into Him, from us dwelling in Him and Christ in us. It flows from having been purchased with His precious blood and redeemed. And so, people of God, if we would be a thankful people, we begin by remembering the mercies of Christ poured out upon us. And if we're not a thankful people, then we need to pause. Take serious note that something's wrong. You see, if our day doesn't begin with our planting our feet on the floor, and crying out in thanks to God, something's wrong. If our day is not peppered with praises and thanks to God, something's 
wrong. If our prayers are not full of thankfulness and the expression of gratitude for God's mercies, something is wrong. Because the apostle says this is the will of God for you in Christ and on account of Christ and through Christ and by the power of Christ. And so if there's a lack of gratitude in your life this evening, then you need to acknowledge it and to run to Jesus and confess it and find strength in Him. And as you do that, you can be sure that He will fill your heart not only with fruit of repentance, but He'll fill your heart with a sense of His gratitude. And your new song will be, your mercies are new every day. Great is your faithfulness. We take the, seri- the duty to give thanks seriously because God does. And so these are our orders. Believer, tonight you are a soldier. You are a soldier of Jesus Christ. You are in an army. You are in the army of the kingdom of God. You have been enlisted. You are Christ's servant because you have been paid for with his precious blood. And so his aim is to turn your life towards him. And one of the ways he would have us express that is spelled out here. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. So let me end tonight by addressing the elephant in the room. This is difficult. No one could say that this is easy. If we measured our life against these three and just these three duties and commands and standing orders, we'd all have to confess tonight that we're falling short of God's glory. So what do we do? Well, the first thing that I would suggest we do is we... We don't diminish the authority of this admonition or of these standing orders. We don't don't dumb them down or sort of try to trim off the edges of them. What we do is we double down on the sense of duty. We let ourselves hear the call. Because committing ourselves to duty leads to more duty and not to less. Committing ourselves to duty leads to more duty and not to less. The person who prays will pray more. You know that from your own experience. I wonder if you've ever argued with yourself about whether you are going to pray. And perhaps you said you knew you should pray. You wanted to pray. It would even be good to pray. But there's just too much going on. You're far too busy. There's not a quiet moment. There's not a spare room. There's all kinds of reasons not to pray. And yet that that impulse to pray still lingers with you. And so what do you do? You finally acquiesce and you start praying. And what is the thing that happens to you when you respond to that impulse to pray? It leads to more prayer. It doesn't just stop at help. It flows. And pretty soon it turns into a river and a torrent of prayers. Praying more leads to more prayer. Rejoicing more leads to more rejoicing. Giving thanks leads to more gratefulness. So just as we hear this tonight, let's hear the call to duty and remind ourselves we stand under orders. And as we respond to that, God will strengthen us. And the second thing I would say to us is remember the gospel. Remember the gospel because the standing orders are the standing orders of the gospel. And so as we think upon the fact that we haven't done all that we should do, the thing that we do is remind ourselves that we have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And as soon as we perceive that and discern that and understand that what we do is we take that straight to the throne of God and the blood of Jesus Christ and 
And we ask God as we confess it to, to cover it over and to forgive our sins and to remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. And we refresh ourselves in the knowledge of Christ's mercies and how His blood was shed for our sin and all of our sins are washed away. And when we stand there at that throne of grace, feeling the overflow of those divine mercies showering down upon us, our hearts are changed. And they're, they're directed to Christ and to His service. And so as we follow that process and continue to ground ourselves in the gospel, uh, we'll know the strength of God so that we will respond reverently, honorably, and obediently to these standing orders of the gospel. Father, we thank you for the challenging words tonight, and yet they're words which teach us to live like Christians. And so help us, God, by the power of your Spirit and the operations of grace within us with a fervent and joyful reflection upon Christ's mercies to hear those orders tonight as orders to enlisted soldiers who've been brought into the ranks of the Lord Jesus Christ with precious blood and who stand in under him with joy and gratitude for all things given unto us. And so, Lord, as we think upon that, help us to be joyful as we take up our calling and obedient in it. And as we do that, help us to know the joy and the fruit of it in our lives and that you would be honored in all things as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.